Under pressure to step down, Mali's president is accused of failing to improve the economy and deal with threats from armed groups. He's dissolved the constitutional court that controversially overturned election results in March. But is that enough? And what if turmoil spirals out of control? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. It's been described as the worst civil unrest Mali has seen in decades. Violent anti-government protests this week left several people dead. President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita has promised to form a national unity government. The country's been without one since elections earlier this year. He's dissolved the constitutional court. That's faced controversy since it overturned provisional results from parliamentary elections in March. But will that be enough to restore peace? Protesters say that the government is corrupt and that the economy is failing and they want President Keita to resign. Al Jazeera's Charlotte Bellis reports. In Bamako, a solemn farewell for protester Faik al Sise. The 30-year-old was killed on Friday. His family says he was shot in front of Mali's National Assembly. His mother was sick already. When we broke the news to her, she had a seizure. The neighbors came out and we comforted her with words from Islam. Thousands of people gathered for Friday's protests, the third since June. They pushed their way into the grounds of parliament and the national television station, burned tires and barricaded roads in the capital. Police responded with tear gas. Gunfire was heard, 60 people were arrested. The protesters returned on Saturday, but in smaller numbers. Their anger is directed at President Ibrahim Bobokar Keita. Demonstrations began in June after Mali's constitutional court overturned election results and have evolved to include frustrations over the economy, alleged corruption and insecurity from armed groups. Repression reinforces our determination and we will continue with our watch until the end of the regime of IBK, which today is a cancer for Mali. On Saturday evening, Keita responded in a televised address. I will continue to favour dialogue with all the active forces of the nation for the establishment of a consensual government team composed of Republican and patriotic groups and not the breakers and demolishers of the country. Mali deserves better than that. He promised to dissolve the court at the heart of the disputed election results, hold re-elections in contested areas and form a national unity government next week. They're an important first step. Um, and I think the, the idea is that the president is going to join with the opposition and have hopefully real dialogue. Um, and, and hopefully this will take place under the eyes of uh, ECOWAS, the regional group that um, I think can actually help make sure that this moves forward smoothly. <laughs> The opposition had earlier rejected Cater's offer to reform the constitutional court and demanded the dissolution of parliament. Following Friday's unrest, three of their leaders were arrested and their headquarters raided. It's unclear whether President Cater's concessions will satisfy them and stop these scenes repeating. Charlotte Ballas, Al Jazeera. Well, Mali struggled to contain a rebellion in the north since 2012. Here's a closer look at uh, some of the armed groups that are operating in the Sahel. There are four main groups, ISIL, Boko Haram, a powerful group called Jamaat Nusrat al-Islam, while Muslimin and uh, Ansar al-Islam. Both are al-Qaeda affiliates. They operate in northern Burkina Faso on the border with Mali. The group ISIL in the Greater Sahara has been launching attacks in Niger since the end of 2016. Boko Haram and ISIL in West Africa are operating from northeastern Nigeria near the border with Niger and Chad. And with the defeat of ISIL in Iraq, some of its fighters may move to the Sahel through Libya.
Let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. Joining us from Bamako is Fatima Al Ansa, who's the special advisor to the Malian Minister of Foreign Affairs. From Rabat, Nufal Aboud, who is director of the Nordic Centre for Conflict Transformation and a specialist on Northwest African affairs. And from Washington, D.C., William Lawrence, former U.S. diplomat in West Africa. A warm welcome uh, to you all. Fatima, if we can start with you first. The president is being accused of failing to deal with the economy and of failing to deal with the armed groups in the north. He's dissolved the constitutional court. Is that going to be enough to appease the protesters? Uh, one thing that we have to understand that is uh, President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita came to power in a very, at, a, at a very difficult time. Uh, um, since 2012, Mali has been going through a lot in terms of uh, political instability, instability uh, security issues, terrorism issues. So it's been a lot to handle as a president. And uh, looking at uh, what happened in the north and trying to also solve what is happening in the in Bamako, it's not easy for any any government. And looking at right now in 2020, and now he has to deal with uh, the COVID-19, which came a lot with. Uh, uh, economical economic crisis and I think that makes the population very very unhappy because like handling a lot of issues already they are angry about how the president is handling the security issues in in northern Mali in central Mali they are angry about how the president is handling the political situation in Mali the health and the education situation and to be honest it's a lot to handle and uh, and that's why the process started in uh, in March when they formed the the movement, uh, which was uh, that the movement was created because of uh, how they believed that the government did not handle very well the okay. uh, legislative uh, election. F Fatima, um, there have been calls for the president to resign. Is he going to? Uh, the president is not going to resign, and I don't think that is the solution because the president is open for dialogue, and I don't think the movement is asking for the president's resignation anymore. And I think that has been the first request, and now they are open for a dialogue. That's why they have been, they propose, they have some propose, they propose that the president uh, creates the national unity government and they also propose the president to dissolve the na national assembly they also propose to the government to dissolve the uh, the constitutional court and in a, as you know in any uh, negotiation you you will have what you demand but you will not necessarily get what you demand and i think that's why the president has okay. given several speeches when he will say that he was open for a dialogue and I don't think the recognition of the president is the solution and is not what the population also is asking for anymore. Nuf uh, Nufal Ab Aboud in, in Rabat, what's your take on this? Uh, Mali's prime minister has promised to rapidly form a government that is, quote, open to facing the challenges of the day. What did he mean by that? And, and is that going to be enough to placate the protesters? Uh... First of all, you know, uh, Mali was in spur uh, of violence, vicious cycle of violence for a long period of time. And even the current president has been seeing the succession of several prime ministers who came and resigned as well. Um, the, the issue here is that in 2015, there was an agreement on boosting the country and, you know, uh, coming out from the cycle of violence by, you know, signing the party, signed uh, Algeria's uh, peace agreement. Uh, that gave, in 2015, and they gave uh, a lot of hope for the population in, in, in Mali, uh, in both sides, even though there, there are some limitations to the, to the agreement. But five years from, from, from that agreement that actually raised so, much, so many expectations for, for the population in Mali, we haven't seen the implementation. It's still, the implementation is still foot dragging by the government and the parties who signed the, 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 the agreement. And that raises so many questions. The country is fragmented. Uh, the country is in contested politics. The proliferation of corruptions, uh, no one can deny it. Everybody agree on that. And the perception of inequalities is, is what the people uh, are, the feeling of the people who are in the streets, actually, they have the feeling uh, of increased perception of inequalities in the country.
William Lawrence in uh, Washington. How much blame for the disaffection that we're currently seeing in Mali can be laid squarely on the shoulders of the president? Is he, as Fatima seems to imply, a victim of circumstance or just inept as a leader? I would say it's more a question of circumstance than lack of uh, confidence or lack of goodwill. Mali is one of the poorest countries in the world. It has some of the least government capacity in the world, and it's been beset by a whole set of, of crises, uh, many of which uh, have been enumerated by your other two guests. And you can add to that a dimension of ethnic violence, um, of religious uh, and religious extremism questions, uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a range of other issues that make Mali very, very hard to govern right now. Um, that said, I think the main mistake the president has made, according, at least according to the massive protesters, is that he's turned a deaf ear um, to a lot of their demands. There was a meeting in late June that was very short, and he didn't seem to be really listening to them. Uh, and uh, uh, as he's made concessions, it doesn't seem to be concessions from negotiation, but just concessions to sort of what's being discussed in the moment. Uh, and so there's a real opportunity here, given the weakness uh, capacity of the government and all these myriad overlapping crises, for the president to turn a page and move towards a more inclusive approach to politics, um, as he says he wants to do and as the protests are, are demanding. I think uh, they keep sort of asking for his resignation and then unasking for his resignation, as your first guest said. Uh, I think in part because they want a negotiated solution, and at this point that negotiated solution has to involve him. I think it's interesting to compare Mali briefly to Sudan and Algeria. In Sudan, you had an international mediation that largely worked. Algeria refused one and has not really had as much progress in terms of a political deal. So uh, the president will have to turn to international help under ECOWAS and other uh, outside players, uh, including European countries, United States, can help, as they did in Sudan. And uh, there, there are prospects for good negotiation. Every, everyone forgets that Mali was one of Africa's strongest democracies politically for about 20 years until things fell apart in 2012. So there is a track record of dialogue, of inclusivity, and Mali needs to return back to that, to its own model that it's had before. So, Fatima, uh, given what we've just heard, uh, how does the president plan to tackle the demands of the protesters? Uh, as I said, the president, uh, after the first protest that happened, the president had made several speeches where he said that he was open for a dialogue and he was open to talk to the protesters so that they can come together and propose something that would be good for the population and for the state as well for the well-being of the country. And last night, he actually made a speech when he actually tangled one of the one of the biggest demands of the protester, which is to dissolve the constitutional court. And after he dissolved the constitutional court, uh, he's going to elect a new, a new member of the, at the, for the constitutional court so that those new members with the, with the right people, uh, with the help of the right people at the gov in the government will be able together to address the demand of the population, which is also the fact that uh, some people believe that uh, they have been uh, a fraud in, in some uh, places uh, during the uh, legislative elections. So uh, after that, the, the new uh, member of the constitutional, uh, constitutional court are in place, then they will solve the next problem. And after that, they will create uh, a unity, a national unity government. And with that, we should be able to, to solve the demand of the protesters. OK, Nufal, uh, if you were advising the, the government in, uh, in Bamako, wh what would your advice be? How did, how did the president and the prime minister move forward? Should, I mean, should there be a government of, of national unity in the first place? First of all, you know, yes, I it has to be some kind of lessons learned uh, about what happened in, in, in Mali and not uh, reinvent the wheel from, from scratch. First of all, you know, like I said, I mentioned the peace agreement that was signed in Algeria, uh, was signed in 2015, uh, that brought some groups from the north all together to be able to move forward. However, uh, like we've seen, you know, and this is what should not be repeated, uh, by the current government is the lack 
of will from 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 the parties and from the government from implementing uh, whatever agreement they come up with. Uh, that's one. Uh, the second thing is that we need to identify exactly what are the interests of uh, key players and actors in the conflict in Mali. And I would like to mention here France and Alger, Algeria. Uh, what, are, what is at stake and what they can do exactly, especially if they are members, especially Algeria, uh, of the uh, Mediation uh, Commission. Thirdly, uh, one of the lessons learned also of the agreement is complete absence of civil society organizations that represent the people from the north and from the south. Uh, and this is very important because it does not give uh, an upper hand to one specific ethnic group or a, a, a number of groups, uh, but it shows that there is a, a genuine uh, uh, dialogue among everybody and especially the the, the participation and effective participation of the population that feed and represent it, especially, for example, women, you know, uh, it's, and young people. And uh, thirdly, you know, the, 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 the vast majority of uh, Malian people have no idea and uh, they have no knowledge of this uh, peace agreement, for instance, this is an example, or uh, they hardly knew about it. So how can we bring all this dialogue that we talk here at, uh, at the government level or, or at, at the agreement level to the population that actually have to, to face everyday, everyday hardship, economically, socially, divides among ethnic groups, and the, their basic needs are not, not uh, met at all for several real, uh, uh, years. So the talk about a dialogue about a future about what's going to happen in five years is no longer going to work to, for the president. The president has to show that actually he can resolve some of the basic needs right now and try to build, first of all, the trust on any agreement on dialogue process. That's the main thing. Okay. Uh, William, um, just before I, I, I put another point to you, do you, do you want to comment on, on what you've heard? Would you agree broadly with that? Well, I would just like to add that um, politics uh, and peacemaking and dealmaking is a lot about who's in what position, uh, and I'm saying this in, in terms of the, uh, the firing of the members of the court and replacing them, but it's also about institution building, and I think one of the recommendations in ECOWAS was to uh, reform the way that constitutional court operates, not just replace the members. Uh, and this gets to the larger point of institution building as a capacity problem here, uh, and so you can as uh, your second guest said earlier, you can have prime minister after prime minister after prime minister and reshuffled cabinet after reshuffled cabinet, but there's a point at which the musical chairs don't solve your problem if you're not uh, building up, as he said, trust and capacity in these various government institutions. And in terms of the last piece that I think hasn't been covered, uh, it's been covered, but I'll just inject it another way here, is that when you talk to Malians, uh, Southerners are often resentful of all the attention being put on the problems in the north and northerners resentful of all the resources being concentrated in the south and that's something that needs to be a major focus of this dialogue and of the international community there need to be new resources for north and south and that explained well to the Malian people William, you talked about the opposition, and you said earlier that, that uh, Mali had been one of the strongest democracies in, in Africa. The opposition in the country has faced something of a dearth of, of political talent uh, until recently, but seems to have coalesced under Imam Mahmoud uh, Diko uh, of late. Who is he, and what are his ambitions? Well, he's a Salafist uh, who doesn't really... Belong, you know, believe in the most extreme for, forms of Salafism. You know, one of the, the quietest Salafists, as we say, so you could call him a conservative Muslim cleric of sorts. He was a supporter of Qaeda until he turned against him around 2015 and then made some sort of crazy statements about homosexuality and punishments of Mali and, and other things like this that, that I think, uh, in my mind, signal to me that at times he might be a little bit of an opportunistic politician more than a mouthpiece of all Malians. But he does bring in um, an element of that religious side, uh, and, and he has a lot of supporters because of that. Um, and he is a, a charismatic leader uh, who, can, who can galvanize the crowds, and that's one of the reasons why um, the opposition has coalesced around him. But if you look at the other six leaders that were arrested um, 
over the last two days, they're very different from each other. They represent different factions of Mal Malian politics and Malian society. Uh, and so this really is an umbrella uh, opposition organization. And uh, to the degree that which Dico can represent all those constituencies, he could emerge as a leader. And to the degree to which that he advances a more narrow uh, agenda, um, I think uh, we'll have that same problem that we had before of no one really speaking for all of the opposition. OK. Uh, Fatima, um, where does ECOWAS come into this? Uh, it's long been involved in Mali. Has it ramped up its assistance uh, of late? Is it helping the president navigate this crisis? Yes, and I think so far the ECOWAS has been doing uh, a good job. They came a uh, few weeks ago. Uh, we have a few Minister of Foreign Affairs from ECOWAS, including the one from Nigeria, Burkina Faso, and Niger. They came to Mali where they met the, the president, and, and they also met uh, the political, the different political leaders who, are, who have been protesting against the regime. They have been trying to understand, like, the the crisis so that they can propose a solution and 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 after that they are trying they have been trying to see how they can implement those solutions and one of those solutions was uh they advised the the president to create a national unity government and also uh and also trying to see how they can dissolve the constitutional court and also try to redo uh, the election in different uh, uh, parts of uh, Mali, where they have been, uh, when the population have been uh, uh, claiming that they have been fraud there. So I think so far, uh, ECOWAS is like watching closely what is going on in Mali and are, and are trying to advise the best way they can. And even last night, when the, the government, uh, the president gave his speech, he mentioned the fact that uh, ECOWAS, uh, they now that he dissolve the constitutional court now they are trying to implement one of the uh, the advices uh, some of the advices that the ECOWAS have given when they visited Mali and I think uh, that shows how we uh, our, our our problems uh, as ECOWAS countries are similar and we should be there for each other and Mali okay. has been there for uh, other ECOWAS countries yeah N Nufal, I, uh we only have about two minutes left here. I hate to ask you to speculate, but using your uh, experience, um, how do you think this is going to, going to play out? Will, will Mali have uh, the same president in, in, a, in a few months' time? Will it be uh, more politically stable? Will it be more at peace? Uh, there is one indicator about that. First of all, uh, I always question to what extent the people who are in the street, the young women and men, are included in any process. Uh, uh, if it, they are not, uh, you know, I, I hate to say that I would be very much pessimistic about anything that will change in the near future. Uh, the second thing is that we need to clarify the position uh, of other uh, foreign uh, uh, forces and countries who are involved in the country who have different priorities than the priorities of the people and even the government in Mali. And uh, uh, thirdly, and this is also very important, is that People, they want to see changes in every day. They can't wait for long. They can't, you can't tell them again in the next five years or, or 10 years things are going to change. If the small incidents uh, at the micro level continue to spur, the greater violence will, will, will continue as well. So uh, I would say as long as the people are involved in any peace agreement or reform or propositions, that I would be very pessimistic about the future of Mali. OK, there, I'm afraid we must uh, leave it. Many thanks indeed to you all, Fatima Al-Ansar, Nofal Aboud and uh, William Lawrence. As always, thank you for watching. Don't forget you can see the programme again anytime just by going to the website. You'll find that at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. I'll see you again. Bye for now.